thank you. My, my name is Joe Darvas from, from Google. And I also have a lot of agreements with the, with the panel, so I can't bring controversy. <laughs> so, but let me use the opportunity to ask some questions. And uh, before asking a question, let me use the metaphor we used that uh, at the beginning, that the euro is a burning house with no exit. Uh, but the question is that which part of the, of the house is burning? And if you look at Germany, uh, unemployment rate is at two decades low. And certainly growth went down somewhat. Uh, borrowing rates are negative in the short term and less than one and a half percent no in nominal terms in the, in the long term. They are below inflation. So I wouldn't say that, that Germany is, is burning. And if you look at our you know, countries near Germany, Austria, and all these countries, then we probably conclude that, I mean, the major problem is that Southern European countries are so different uh, from this poor Europe that they are causing, causing the problem. And certainly they have an impact on, on the rest of the Euro area. And taking this as a, as a, as a background, um, I have my th three questions are, are the following. The first one is that many panelists emphasize that uh, I mean flexibility and proper structural reforms are, are crucial. And my first question is that if this new European architecture, for example, the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, whereby the Commission gives very detailed suggestions to each country what they should do, so that this will be sufficient to help these countries to basically solve these fundamental structural problems. The second one is related to the debt problem that you mentioned, that uh, debt, not just public debt, but also private debt is too high in a number of countries. And my question is that how it should be solved. You said that if it will be solved in one way or another, then after that Poland may consider joining, but what does this one way or, or another means? And the second, which is related to the first two, that if basically none of these two will have a satisfa satisfactory solution, then, then what remains is, is a possible exit of, of the euro. So do you think that ultimately an exit should be exit of, let's say, the whole Southern Europe or some of these countries should be the solution if they will not be able to fix their structural problems and not be able to fix their huge debts? Thank you. <laughs> Very easy questions. Uh, <laughs> how to solve the problem. Uh, okay, I mean, first of all, about the about the debt problem because that stands all the um, I mean obviously they can't be joining the eurozone in any case uh, I would say uh, obviously there are various ways to the leverage to to to, to cut out the, to 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 eliminate the, the debt and you can do it through inflation you can do it through the through the growth it's actually not possible very much in Europe uh, these days so through the inflation through the massive bankruptcies through the through the long-term savings and, and slow growth as, as, as well. And uh, uh, the problem is that different method leads to a different um, distribution of the costs uh, between the debtors and the, and the, and the um, creditors. And uh, uh, my view is very simple. Uh, most likely, rather than searching for some solution that is in the interest, for example, of Germany only, let them self and uh, let them save and so on. Or uh, to just the extreme other one, let's print the money and let the German lose the, <laughs> the, the, the debt or the savings or something like that. Well, I'm absolutely sure that what Europe demands is finding a, a reasonable mix, a mix of the cost of the, of the, of the distribution of the cost of reducing the uh, unbearable uh, debt uh, burden. And uh, how it's done uh, through the combination of saving plus some uh, loosening of the monetary policy of the ECB plus maybe some bailing out and, and so on and so on. Uh, that's, that's subject to a discussion. But the basic point is if the Europeans are to close this bad story of the, of the economic history of Europe with the feeling that Europe found its way out of this, the story shouldn't be that one of the partners forces the others to accept only the distribution of costs that's in his interest and against the interest of, of, of the other. So finding a, a compromise is a key is a key point here. A compromise that, for example, is that obviously means a, a compromise between the bedding cows, between the um, some agreements on, on more flexibility of the ECB uh, monetary policy and, uh, and, and obviously the savings in the southern countries that, that are uh, absolutely uh, unavoidable. For the time being, the whole discussion was nobody wanted to, to find a compromise. Everybody wanted to have his 
uh, opinion prevailing, with Germany being the strongest one, so actually the German voice being louder and louder. Uh, having said so, I must say the next question is, will in that set situation southern countries leave the Eurozone or not? Well, that's that status and actually the problem is not really in the fact that the southern countries were totally unable to live with the hard currency. I don't think that we've got the proof of something like that. We've got the proof that in a situation when you are allowed to live in a weak uh, macroeconomic framework and you didn't have the right to print your money and to devaluate, but you had the right to draw the capital easily, uh, that was just replacement of one soft regime to another soft regime. And, and, and the southern countries behave simply the same way that before, but rather than accepting higher inflation, they're just accepting higher debt. Will they be able to live in a condition once there will be no more uh, possibility to live at the expense of the rising debts or, or, or devaluating the currency? And will they be able to, uh, to, to, to structurally adjust to this? Well, I would still say I, I don't see the reasons why we should assume that the Spaniards or the Italians are physically not fit to living with a, with a hard currency. By God, they were living with a hard currency for centuries, uh, with the gold currency, and somehow they were uh, developing. So I don't, send, I don't see the answer. The answer will be more political, basically. What will be the, the society's decision rather than, than purely economic? Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, if, if I might just briefly add, I mean, I think that the issue isn't just can they live with a, a hard currency or not, but it's can there be one monetary, you know, can there be enough synchronization or fiscal transfers or other measures or uh, really deepening the, the union so that one monetary policy works in the way that it mostly works in a place like the United States, right? Where, yes, North Dakota right now actually needs uh, very high interest rates, whereas, you know, California needs low, low ones. Um, so, so I think that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the challenge. I mean, one scenario, you know, to, to the last question, um, you know, could I, I, I still th I still think there there could be euro exits. I mean, one scenario is there could be countries leaving the euro, and you know, and and some of the Eastern European countries could end up joining a more integrated, smaller one. There, there's any number of permutations, but I think the issue is looking around at the locations, whether it's Cyprus or or other places where the debts don't look sustainable and where making a, an adjustment solely on a fiscal basis um, is just going to mean depression. And that's not good for individual countries or, um, or the Eurozone or the global economy for that matter. Last question, here please. Uh, I'm a, a journalist from New York uh, and, and I found it interesting none of you have mentioned employment. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm my question is, uh, can you envision or uh, uh, do you see the importance pre-Eurozone joining of, of strengthening employment, that would be the first, I guess, crucial test, but also convincing the Polish population that by joining the Eurozone, you don't uh, jeopardize the possibility of, of uh, this, this absurd situation that you now have in countries like, uh, like Greece and Spain, uh, which is it really almost depression level unemployment. So is, is not the task of, of the Polish government or whoever is, is making these, these uh, arguments that you can actually strengthen employment by joining the Eurozone. Thanks for opening. I might actually take one, one last question to go with that, and then we'll come around up. Kasia. But I'm afraid that you may need crystal balls to, to answer this question. <laughs> I'm Katarzyna Rytkowańska from Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You all touched upon uh, a very interesting and, and significant thing concerning the structural reforms ahead of Polish economy. But I would just like to ask you, especially Professor Orłowski and Mr. Czynski, um, a question. If Poland sticks to the current trajectory of development and if it meets the criteria, 
uh, to join the Eurozone. And if it joins the Eurozone by 2020 or later or whatsoever, what will it bring with it to the Eurozone? I mean, will it make the Eurozone uh, stronger, healthier and more competitive? Thank you. Right ho, you're all standing be between these hungry people and their lunch. Um, <laughs> re really a minute and a half each, if you would, two of us. Okay, uh, I, I'll be very quick. Um, uh, let me go back to the question concerning employment. I have no doubts that this is a huge challenge ahead of the Polish government. Uh, first of all, uh, labor regulation. It needs to be flexible. Secondly, um, um, wage restraint. Uh, the, the case of Estonia and other Baltic Republic showed that it was a part of success. And also um, mature um, uh, public partnership, I mean dialogue between uh, trade unions and employers. This is essential for our success in the Eurozone. If there is not uh, enough of that, I, 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 I am very much afraid that Eurozone can become a curse for us uh, uh, if we don't meet uh, these uh, conditions. And uh, one last final word. Uh, um, uh, there was a, um, I mean, uh, the, the subject is so com complicated that sometimes it's good to react with laughter uh, as regards certain challenges. There was a cartoon in the Polish weekly Politica, uh, a fake opinion poll asking a question, would you be ready to accept Euro? And the answer was 3% no, 97% said yes, I will accept any amount of Euros. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's a good comment. Um, I think in the, uh, in the question of, of what, uh, what Poland can bring to the Eurozone, um, I think that this is a... I mean, it's, it's an economy which does need some structural reforms, but in, in it's still an economy which has catch-up growth potential, uh, and over the longer term, I mean, somebody here mentioned that it was still a tiger economy compared to Italy and Spain. I mean, that's not really with, with growth around half a percent a year. That's not much of a tiger, but, but it still does have higher growth potential than the rest of the, uh, the than, than, than much of the, of the Eurozone. And I think it's, uh, it's an economy which is relatively dynamic, relatively more entrepreneurial than, uh, than, uh, than a lot of uh, West European countries. And I think it's something that could act as a, as a, as a positive stimulus for, uh, for uh, much of the rest of the Eurozone. And uh, I remember a, well, a year or so ago, I was talking to, the, uh, to Foreign Minister Sikorsky, and he was saying, you know, we started this transformation in 1989, we were Eastern Europe. Over the years, we've migrated, and now we're Central Europe. We're, uh, as we've joined the NATO and, and the, the European Union, uh, our destination is to be Northern Europe. And I think that that's, uh, that that's, that's a reasonable sort of trajectory. And I think that Poland can be a, a positive influence for, uh, for the rest of the Eurozone. Uh, well, to answering both questions, I mean, first, uh, what Poland can bring. You know, uh, what the Eurozone gives is actually of what it promises. It's actually the availability of the cheap capital to the places in which you can uh, invest this capital in a uh, more effective way than the countries that with the abundance of the, of the capital, right? So uh, what, Poland, what Poland can bring to the Eurozone, and depending on the situation in Poland, because we will have this cheap capital if we arm reform to the degree that we will use it for the effective investment, then the Eurozone, the whole Eurozone, the whole Europe will benefit from a faster growth. If we make the Greek way of using the cheap capital for, for the increase of the consumption, that obviously everybody will, will have problems with, with, with us earlier or later. So that's the simple question, depending on, on our preparation and, and coming back to the point. Where we are talking about the structural reforms, we had the employment, first of all, or the probably in the back of our minds. And, and think about one, one element. Ten years ago, Germany was a much faster growing economy than today. And had the unemployment, was fighting with unemployment of more than 10%, and, and that was a nightmare. Today, Germany is in a stagnation and has got the record low unemployment levels because they did the structural reforms. That, uh, and I in a sense, it's a lesson for everybody in the long run you fight the unemployment by making the structural reforms, by making the economy more flexible, the labor market more flexible, uh, while obviously in the short run there are always the fluctuations of the, of the unemployment. So that's a lesson for Poland, how to prepare for the, for the Eurozone. Thank you. Yeah, w w one statement, because I know we're at lunchtime, but I think all the, me all the, all the measures uh, on, on employment, they have to be, again, it goes back to what we've been saying, they have to be done inside the Eurozone or without it. And I think the, the answer is this may not be, I mean, historically, Poland, um, historically, countries <laughs> entering the Eurozone have gotten a lot of cheap capital. 
it's not at all clear to me if that's what's going to be the story going forward. I think that, all you know, all and and so it's about using using the capital. We're probably in a world where capital is going to become cheaper, at least shorter term capital is going to become cheaper for a very long period of time. But we live in a world where foreign direct investment, long term investment, is is scarce um, because businesses are uncertain about the long term trajectory. Um, but so, which is in a sense a way of half answering both bo both questions. Nathan, that, that adds up to one answer. Well done, you. Um, right, ho. Word and ends. Um, uh, I, I have to say, I normally find these questions inanely boring, but I've had quite a jolly time. So, thank you very much to you for your questions, <laughs> um, and and to our panelists. Before you disappear for lunch, please please join me in in thanking them for. for <laughs>